morning, Red Door. Let's worship. Pastor Zach here. So happy you're joining us online. We hope you're having a great day. We hope you had a great week. Uh, we are really taking an opportunity as a church during this season that's unique and unprecedented. We are really wanting to take this opportunity not to squander it and look back and go, man, I wish we would have done something better with our time. I wish we would have done this during that time. We want to take an opportunity and capture the moment during this season of disconnection, the season of isolation, we felt as a church, as a leadership team, what if we took this opportunity to dig deeper in our relationship? What if we took this opportunity and, and really took time to slow down, to listen, and to wait upon God? What would happen? What would happen if we allowed the noise outside to dissipate and we really put our attention into really growing in our relationship? 
So as a church, we're taking week and week at, week by time to really focus on certain practices and disciplines. Week one, we looked at silence and solitude, this idea of eliminating noise. We looked on the second week of this idea of distractions, how easily we are distracted. Last Sunday was Easter, and we hopefully you had an opportunity to, to dig into the Easter story and kind of reimagine, recapture, and retell that story. But today we're going to continue in this series, a series, A New Way Forward, and look at this idea of simplicity. Now, I know it's kind of trendy right now, and there's lots of different TV shows about uh, becoming modern and uh, trimming down and organizing your closet, but simplicity is, is more than just a trend. It's more than just being reorganized in your closet. There's something at the, at the heart of it that I want us to capture, but I want to start with a question, okay? It's an age-old question. It's one that we've all heard, we've all thought of. What would you do with a million dollars? Okay, what would you do with a million dollars? Just, I want you to just think about it for just a second. And, and maybe if there's someone in the room with you, ask them, what would you do with a million dollars? Now I know it's an unrealistic question. It's the reality of getting a million dollars is probably not likely, but this unrealistic question really reveals our hearts. You see, it triggers something inside of us that we think, what if? What if I had a million dollars? What it does for me and maybe for you, it triggers this idea of, well, I could fix that and this would change my life and I'd be able to go visit this and be, have this and, and maybe buy a new home and man, my life would be so much easier, so much better. And I think we're all in that same boat that so many times we look at these big ideas that if I just had that, man, everything would be better. You see that question, not a bad question, but it really triggers and reveals our heart. And I'm not saying you're a bad person because I, I'm in the same boat because I think so many times if I could just have that, if I could just get this amount of money at work, if I could just buy this house, if I could just have one extra car, if I could have whatever it is, fill in the blank, we think that that will help us attain, it will solve, it will provide something better. But in reality, we're just getting caught in the cycle of all these things. You see, I think for most of us, when we think about a million dollars, there's this internal catalog of things we want, desires we have, places we want to go. And it triggers this idea that it almost tricks us into thinking that if I, if I have that, man, my life would be complete. And I know, unfortunately, all of us have been there, done that. We know that when we get to those certain things, when we have those certain things, we just want more. We want something else and nothing is ever good enough because we're caught in the cycle that Jesus is going to talk about, this idea of accumulating treasures. I think we see in a culture that we live in of excess and uh, commercialism and materialism and, and consumerism and all these ideas of showcasing our, our properties and our possessions, Jesus actually commands us to live a lifestyle of simplicity. When everything else around us is saying you need more, Jesus is saying you need less. See, the Pharisees in first century, as Jesus walked about and taught, the Pharisees actually believed that God gave them more things and gave them greater things the more that they did for him. And so in their mind, they were accumulating lots of different things and accommodations and then their possessions and riches and wealth and notoriety and all these things in their mind felt that God must love us and bless us more because we are his prized possession. When Jesus came along, he actually taught the opposite. Jesus actually taught that, that it's actually better to have less, that less is more. If you have a Bible with me, I want you to turn with me to the scripture. It's just a, a very simple scripture in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Again, it's a scripture that we have all read many times. In fact, you've probably heard this at church. If you've been at church any time in your lifetime, you've heard this shared probably uh, on a Sunday when they're talking about giving. And I think the scripture has elements of that in there. And many times we've probably twisted it to fit certain categories. But Jesus is talking about treasure, okay? And if you have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. It says this, Jesus is teaching this to uh, a crowd. <clears throat> Excuse me, he's teaching it to many, many people who are listening. And he says this, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, 
where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. All right, I want to unpack this just shortly. We'll give you one little idea here. There's an interesting phrase in here that I think we need to understand because it kind of unlocks the passage. Like most scriptures in the Bible, we sometimes read it, and we just kind of read it very quickly and on the surface. But Jesus taught much deeper. In fact, Jesus taught principles that we sometimes don't catch. And there's a principle in here that Jesus is teaching. It's really interesting in the Greek we have to understand this. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves. Other translations, it says lay up. Now, he's not talking about basketball terms, and he's not talking about, you know, storing up all these things. What he's actually referring to is a piece of furniture in a house, okay? The Greek word for store up or lay up is actually a word that says theso ridso, okay? Theso ridso. Again, you're not going to be tested or quizzed, so you don't have to memorize that, but theso ridso is a Greek word for a a phrase called a strong box, okay? So when Jesus says, do not store up, store up is actually referring to a piece of equipment uh, or a piece of furniture or a a piece of uh, a box in a house that Jesus is referring to, (coughs) excuse me. It says, so rid so refers to an equipment called the strong box. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The strong box in first century they didn't have banks, they didn't have safety deposit boxes, uh, they didn't have any of those types of things. In fact, many times they would store it by digging it in the ground. And in fact, if we read another scripture, Jesus talks about a parable about a guy digging up a treasure. Very well could have been someone like this. Uh, but they had was not necessarily banks, but they had uh, strong boxes. And these were simply wooden chests. Uh, It could have been even a metal chest. It was locked up. It was where they put their valuables, uh, money, wealth, prized possessions, anything that brought value to them was placed in there. In fact, many of them, it was the first thing you saw in a house when you came in. In fact, beyond that, we see throughout history that the wealthier you were, the more elaborate and decorated your strong box was. So it wasn't just a place for practical terms for storing valuables but in fact became a showpiece because the more elaborate, the more decorative piece you had, the greater it showed other people how wealthy and prominent you were. You see, throughout history, humans have always been prone to store up things. In fact, I bring you this message in my garage and I didn't do that because I was trying to get away from noisy kids and loud dogs, uh, but to give you the fact of this idea of how easy it is for us to store up things, right? You see, our strong boxes throughout 2000 years have gotten bigger and more abundant. In fact, we have rooms dedicated to storage, garages of things stored and piled upon others. And this is no one's fault, but (coughs) mine. Uh, But this is a garage that we put things in that we don't use all the time. 2000 years later, you and I are no different than those in first century We just store more and more and more things. See, I was reading this week in some statistics and understanding this, here are some facts that you can kind of help understand this. In America, the self-storage business is a $38 billion industry. Can you imagine? $38 billion is generated from metal boxes with storage. I mean, that is mind-blowing to think that that big of business, that big of industry is all driven by people who need more things to store. Another statistic says one in 11 Americans pay to have space to store their overflow. One out of every 11 Americans store their stuff in an overflow uh, storage place. 65% of Americans who rent a storage unit also have a garage filled with stuff. So 65% of people who are paying for a storage unit already have a garage full, and so they have to rent another one. Last little statistic is this, is that there are more storage facilities, okay, not units, facilities in America than there are McDonald's and Starbucks's combined, okay? We not only love our Big Macs and our Starbucks, but we love our storage units in America. We love to store stuff. We love to accumulate and collect and hold on to things because there's something in all of us to store up. 
What Jesus is referring to here in this first passage, do not store up, do not collect storage boxes, do not collect strong boxes of things that you think have great meaning that could easily rust, decay, and be stolen. Now, Jesus isn't saying to you and I that we can't have golf clubs and extra car and and two-car garage. He's not saying you can't have those things. In fact, he doesn't say anything about that. He's really driving at the pursuit of those treasures. That's what he's driving home in this passage here. So Jesus is addressing the pursuit for abundance and consumption. That's the thing that Jesus wants to teach you and I. That's what he was teaching his disciples and those listening in the Sermon on the Mount. He's, He's driving home this fact. He's saying, hey, what you pursue, the consumption in the abundance of things is what needs to be addressed. What is your pursuit? What are you driving for? What are you going at that is taking all of your pursuit to collect and consume? This is why Jesus is commanding you and I and his disciples to live a lifestyle of simplicity. Because when we live simple, We're not caught up with driving towards the overconsumption, materialism, and possessions that we sometimes can get caught up into. Simplicity is a a shift in how we see value and identity. I love this. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus says, A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Richard Foster, an author, said this, The majority of Christians have never seriously wrestled with the problem of simplicity. Conveniently ignoring Jesus' many words on the subject, the reason is simple. This discipline directly challenges our vested interests in a fluent lifestyle. When enough is always just a little bit more than you already have, you don't have a lot enough room to truly great pleasures of life like family, friends, time, and to enjoy them. Richard is, is Foster is an author and talks a lot about simplicity really driving home this idea that simplicity is hard because here's what it does. Simplicity is difficult for you and I to really attach ourselves to because we've attached our value and identity to our possessions and accumulations in life. I want to make sure that we catch that. Simplicity is hard. It's a hard shift because you and I, we've attached our value, our identity, and really our accomplishments in life to the things that we've collected, the possessions we have, and the achievements we have. We've attached our value and our identity to it. So when Jesus begins to pull that away and begin to separate the two, it's hard because so much of our identity and our value is wrapped up into what we have achieved, what we've purchased, what we've saved up for. Again, they're not bad things, but Jesus is saying when our identity and value are attached to them, that's the problem. That's the danger that he's trying to drive home to us. That's what he's trying to teach you and I. And that simplicity helps us detach our value and our identity to the things that the world says you need to have. Culture, again, and self tells us, the more you have, the greater you are. But Jesus, man, he teaches this. The less you accumulate, the greater you'll experience God's kingdom. So culture tells us, The more I have, the bigger things I get, the more I get, the greater I am in everyone's eyes. But Jesus says the less we accumulate, the more we experience God's kingdom here on earth. Jesus talks about three different things in this passage. If you're looking at it, Matthew chapter 6, three simple commands. First one is this. He says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth. We look at the word store up. But what's he talking about? What treasures is he talking about? He's talking about money. He's talking about 401ks, savings accounts. No, Jesus is is really driving home here that earthly treasures are anything that we value. Anything that we can tangibly, practically value. Could be clothes, could be cars, could be Bitcoin, it could be savings accounts, it could be retirement. Again, none of those things Jesus says are inherently bad, but in the pursuit of them is what he's trying to catch here. He says... Anything that you seem to collect, valuables that you find precious to you, he says three things can happen. Moth will come and eat it away. Rust will decay it. Or thieves will steal it. Now, he's not, he's not telling us that things are going to be destroyed of ours. He's just giving us the idea, illustrating it, that, that things that we value so much, the things that we work so hard to get in a split second can be gone. 
In a split second, the economy can change. In a split second, a pandemic can happen, a tornado can happen, a flood can happen. And the things that we've worked so hard for can disappear like that. In fact, in first century, we don't have a lot of moths here in our culture today, but moths were a big deal there because they didn't have a closet full of clothes. They didn't have a garage full of, you know, rubber-made tubs full of winter clothes and summer clothes. They had a few different outfits. In fact, many times they were wool. And moths would come, it's disgusting, but they would lay their eggs and larvae would grow and they would eat the wool. And so the next time they put on their sweater, they would have these holes because the larva has eaten away at this fabric. And Jesus is referring to that idea. Rust again decays and eats away metal. And thieves breaking in, again, something that's common today as well, but in first century, they didn't have security systems. And many times their houses were made out of mud and limestone, and they would literally, thieves would literally dig through a hole in a wall and steal strong boxes out of houses. And Jesus is just given this idea that everything you consider valuable can be taken away in a split second. He says, don't store up. Don't put all your stuff in strong boxes that you think are valuable because moths, rust, and thieves can come. The second one he says is this. He said, in fact, instead of that, store up treasures in heaven. Now, I don't believe Jesus is referring to a reward-based pyramid scheme in heaven here. He's not saying that if you, if you do things here on earth, you're going to get double in heaven. Uh, in fact, I don't think anything he's referring to is a reward-based system in heaven that we're going to get more if we do more down here. That is sometimes perceived out of this scripture, but what he's really referring to is this idea of understanding what value is, okay? Jesus is not referring to literal money and coins and, and treasures that you and I sometimes might think of. The treasure that Jesus is really referring to is the kingdom of God. The, the absolute treasure that he's referring to is he himself and experiencing God's kingdom. That is the greatest treasure, it's not a million dollars. It's not an extra stall in a garage. It's not having this or that. It's simply being a part of God's kingdom. He's simply readjusting how we should see value. He's saying, hey, your, your earthly things that you get caught up in, that, that's not treasure. True treasure is heavenly. It's God's kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. That is the amazing treasure. Readjusting our vows. So when he's talking about treasure here, he simply is saying this is that when you invest and, and store up treasures in heaven, he's talking about investing in God's kingdom. So I think of things like this. When you're storing up treasures in heaven, it's this. It's helping those who need help. It's giving money and food to those who are poor, those who are struggling, helping those with injustice and those who are oppressed. It's extending forgiveness. You ever thought about that? Forgiveness is a tangible, uh, eternal God kingdom experience that's a treasure to extend forgiveness and receive forgiveness it's it is literally giving and generosity when we god uses earthly treasures to to bless and to do things here on earth and so you have the ability to give earthly treasures away to expand god's kingdom that's why we give at churches to continue the work that god is doing through his church it's silence and solitude Time alone, when you're praying and reading the word, that is a treasure that God is depositing into God's kingdom, that you're participating in the treasure of God's kingdom. Knowing God's word, devoting yourself to his word, to being accountable, to having obedience. Have you ever thought about obeying God as a treasure? I, we don't think of it because we're so focused in our culture of, of receiving this, that I want this, I have this. But when we read God's word and we obey his word, that is a treasure we receive because we partake and experience God's kingdom. All of these things are treasures in God's kingdom. They're eternal, heavenly treasures that you and I need to experience here on earth. See, Jesus is simply telling us that true treasure is living and experiencing God's kingdom here on earth. Experiencing God's kingdom on earth. And that's why he closes with his very last phrase. Okay, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He drives us one last little line to kind of bring us back around to re-engage, to kind of re-evaluate, kind of almost calibrate our mind and our heart to be the same. That 
we think this and our heart does this. Jesus is saying, hey, where your heart is, your treasure will follow. So Jesus knows that whatever we value is reflected in how we live. You could go look at your daily life and your weekly life and even during this quarantine time, you, you see what's affected by how you live. You look at your bank account, you look at your time spent, you'll see very quickly what you value in your life. And Jesus is trying to re help us to re-engage and re-understand this idea of going, okay, my treasure is him. I find my treasure in being in his kingdom. I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. He says, everything which hinders us from loving God above all things and acts as a barrier between ourselves and our obedience to Jesus is our treasure and the place where our heart is. I want to finish with this one last idea that I want you to capture today. See, simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. Simplicity is an inward truth that we hold on to, that we believe, and it changes how we live and how we act. It changes how we, how we budget. It changes how we spend our money. It changes how we spend our time and what we consider valuable and what, we, what we're investing into. Again, Jesus isn't saying that you, you should get rid of your 401k and you should live in a smaller house. He's not, he doesn't say those type of commands. Now, you might be convicted of that, and that's between you and him. But what Jesus is trying to get us to understand is, where is your value? Where's your pursuit? If it's not kingdom, if it's not him, we need to readjust that. We need to simplify our lives. And the biggest thing that we see in our culture today is a distraction of materialism and consumption. We are so bombarded with constantly these things and that thing, and I need this, and I need to achieve this, I want to make more of this, that we just begin to be so overwhelmed with this pursuit of earthly treasures that will never satisfy, never fulfill, and never extend our life. But the only thing that Jesus says that we can is to invest in God's kingdom, to partake and pursue the true treasures, the true riches of his kingdom, to expand it, to, to reach, to serve people, to love people, to spend time with Jesus. That's the treasure he's talking about. Proverbs 23 says this, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. For it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. How true is that proverb? <laughs> Again, I want to make note, it's not wrong to have possessions. It's not necessarily wrong to have a garage filled with stuff. But it's the pursuit and the value that we need to wrestle with. We really need to re-examine and wrestle with this idea of, what am I pursuing? What are my strong boxes in my life? What am I trying to accumulate and hold on to? That will reveal where our heart is. Jesus is challenging us not, not to allow the pursuit of possessions and, and abundance and materials to become our treasure, but simply to have our treasure be found in the pursuit of God's kingdom. You see, he's, he's wanting to shift our, our pursuit of treasure here on earth. He wants to shift it from the possessions and materials and, and all of these types of things that we can easily be consumed with, shift that to really seeing that our value and treasure is in the pursuit of his kingdom. You see, in that, when we catch that, it changes everything in our life. See, simplicity is, is simply this. I, I thought about this week, just kind of a, a really quick idea of understanding what does it mean to live simple? It's, it's not just paring down your clothes and organizing your closet. Those things are, are practical ways to help develop those practices. But at its core, simplicity is this. It's a personal discipline to reestablish our values and pursuits to reflect God's kingdom here on earth. I want to say that again. If you're taking notes, jot this down. Simplicity is a personal discipline to reestablish our values and pursuits to reflect God's kingdom here on earth. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. How can you begin to simplify your life? Again, it maybe is cleaning out a, a garage. 
Maybe it's simply learning to say, you know what, I want to give 20% away a year. I want to make a, I want to make a goal next year that I want to give 20% away of my income. I can live on 80%. I want to give away 20%. How, how cool would that be? What if, what if for you, you say, you know what, maybe we can have someone else live with us in our house. It might be inconvenient. It might not be comfortable, but you know what? We have extra room. What if we were a blessing to somebody who's struggling that they could live with us? Hey, you know what? Maybe we have an extra car that I really don't need, and maybe we could bless somebody with it. You see, those types of things, those are treasures. Those are kingdom treasures that Jesus is talking about, saying when we begin to tap into those treasures, we experience greater things than we could ever imagine, greater than a million dollars. Because when we experience God's kingdom, it changes us. And a life simplified allows us to be more attentive to hear and to see God's kingdom at work. This week, we're going to give you 10 practices, 10 things that you can practically do. One of them is just simply purging clothes and things in your house that you haven't touched for six months. I want to encourage you this week. Try one or two of these. We're going to give you 10, one each day, maybe a couple each day. And I want to encourage you, find ways to begin to simplify practices. All these things are just practical tools. At the end of the day, you need to spend some time with God and say, God, where are the strong boxes in my life? What have I collected that's not kingdom focused? Guys, we love you guys. We miss you so, so much. And we pray that you have a fantastic, simple week. God bless you.